Thank you everyone for joining our Technology uh, Tuesday series. Uh, we have a treat uh, for you today. Uh, please join me in, in welcoming our featured author today, uh, Frank uh, Pasquale. Uh, Mr. Pasquale is here to discuss his latest book, New Laws of Robotics, Defending Human Expertise in the Age of AI. He is a noted expert on the law of artificial intelligence, algorithms, and machine learning. He is a prolific and nationally regarded scholar whose work focuses on how information is used across a number of areas, including health, law, commerce, and tech. His wide-ranging expertise encompasses the study of the rapidity of technolog technological advances and the unintended consequences of the interaction of privacy law, intellectual property, and antitrust laws, as well as the power of private sector intermediaries to influence healthcare and education finance policy. Mr. Pasquale has advised business and government leaders in healthcare, internet and finance industries, including the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the U.S. House Judiciary and Energy and Commerce Committees, the Senate Banking Committee, the Federal Trade Commission, and Directorates General of the European Commission. He's also an affiliate fellow at Yale University's Information Society Project and a member of the American Law Institute. So, without further ado, please, please again join me in welcoming uh, Frank today. Well, thanks so much. I so appreciate that very kind introduction, and I am just honored to be back at Noblitz. So I think I gave my last book talk in 2015, uh, perhaps 2016, um, and uh, was in person and just uh, really enjoyed the day and the just very brilliant group of folks that you know came to speak with me afterward. And it's uh, great to be here virtually. And um, I just want to say that you know if I will be speaking and then of course taking questions. Uh, if anyone needs a clarification while I'm speaking, just feel free to uh, raise a hand or because uh, uh, I'm happy to do so. Um, but is the, the full screen. And so um, moving forward with respect to um, New Laws of Robotics, this book is something that really came out of the last project. So in my prior uh, Harvard University Press book, um, Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms That Control Money and Information, I was really interested in a critique of some uh, unfair practices that I thought were becoming more common, which were uh, re rendering a lot of ordinary citizens extremely uh, transparent to um, authorities, perhaps too transparent, and that were uh, well, simultaneously um, many uh, large firms and uh, even uh, agencies of the government were becoming uh, less and less transparent. And I wanted to find a way in black box society to suggest um, better modes of uh, balance between transparency and accountability and privacy um, for all of these groups. And th that book, I think, really struck a chord because it did respond to a lot of concerns about um, lack of accountability of uh, large financial and social media firms, which um, have, especially with respect to social media firms, have only uh, grown to this day. Um, this book, The New Laws of Robotics, is essentially a vision of where we go once we've acknowledged the black box problem. And we've acknowledged the severity and scope of the issue with issues with respect to accountable artificial intelligence. And so what New Laws of Robotics is, um, uh, the aspiration here, is to put forward four relatively simple principles that can stand for, that could uh, essentially serve as laws governing um, future deployment of AI robotics, um, while simultaneously um, expounding upon them at some length in terms of explaining how they could be actually implemented in current legal systems, particularly in North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. Those are sort of the, and this book is a much more international in scope. Uh, one of the feedback I got, the feedbacks I got from Black Box Society was that they felt it was overly focused on the US. And so 
you know, acknowledging, hey, the U.S. is only 5% of the world population. We've got to um, sort of learn from other jurisdictions. What this book tries to do is to, is to look at those other jurisdictions and see how they're handling these problems. And in that way, it reflects some of my ongoing work, um, both with um, Kohubikol, which is a program called Counting as Being a Human Being um, at um, uh, University of Radboud in uh, the Netherlands, as well as, uh, and, and at that, that function, I'm uh, the co-editor-in-chief of the journal, journal uh, of Cross-Disciplinary Research and Computational Law. And then also in some of my work with the um, Australian, uh, with an Australian network on automated decision-making. Uh, recently, the Australian Research Council awarded the network a seven-year grant. Um, so I'm very glad it's long-term because otherwise I'd never get a chance to, uh, to go on this grant, but I, I'll be waiting a few years to be helping the Australians um, uh, with respect to their automated decision-making uh, systems. And so with respect to, you know, starting out the, the normative orientation of the book, um, oh, and I should come back to just the, the book subtitle just for one second. With respect to the subtitle of the book about defending human expertise, what I found was often at the root of problems with the rapid deployment of AI and robotics was a devaluation of human expertise by um, those who felt that the AI and robotic systems were advancing at such a pace that they could displace or substitute for uh, human experts. And so that was sort of the, the core, and that's why I sort of subtitled it Defending Human Expertise in the Age of AI, because I think there's a lot to be done, both as a matter of, on the micro level of improving processes, and on the macro level of the political economy of labor, to recognize that it's not as if all forms of human endeavor are eventually going to be taken over by uh, robots and AI. Um, there's always going to be a room for the domain expert to be guiding the technical expert and to be giving feedback to technical experts about exactly what they are doing in given realms. And so today's talk, I can't cover you know, every case study in the book, but I can give a few. Now, of course, I have to give the background to a, a piece like this is to say that there are, of course, paradigm cases for rapid automation. Right. I mean, in manufacturing, this is an example of the Baxter robot, and this is a robot that can watch individuals who are, say, working at an assembly line. The robot can uh, model um, in its own processors uh, what it takes for in an arm or, in its case, an actuator to reach out and to um, uh, pick up a piece of machinery and to put it into a box. And relatively quickly, an entity, a robot like this, can watch a worker at an assembly line and figure out how to imitate them. Okay? So that's a rel relatively straightforward example. I think that that sort of inspiration of the robots on the manufacturing line, which has been a topic of debate, I mean, almost for 100 years. I mean, if we think back to the 1930s and some of the crises of joblessness that were blamed on automation then, um, and in the 1960s, there was a, a huge dialogue and discourse on automation, uh, this for Presidential Commission on the Triple Crisis. And now today, um, there has been an expansion of an extrapolation of these types of relatively straightforward ways of mimicking human activity in other fields. So we see the rise of robotics in logistics, right? We see these little sidewalk robots that go around and can deliver food. Um, we see the aspiration by companies like Uber and Lyft to eventually have um, robotic driving. Although even there, it's rather fascinating, you know, how much the di dialogue has changed over the past five years. I would say when I started this book in 2015, there were a lot of people that were essentially saying, you know, uh, human drivers are just going to be completely eliminated within the next five to 10 years. You know, that this is just going to cause a massive crisis because there's like 10 to 15 million people in America that rely on these jobs. What will happen to all the rest stops? What will happen to all the highway apparatus and all the, the, the businesses that serve these people, et cetera? And it seems right now that that's a pretty, um, out, that, that that concern was very premature, right? And, and I think that there's a lot to be said about my larger thesis about the role of human experts and professionals in the age of AI. Um, if you could extrapolate from the problems of AI with respect to logistics. And part of those problems involve, you know, a lack of technical capacity. Part of them involve a lack of, a, a, a lack of an ability to estimate the degree to which um, uh, driving and logistics are socio-technical systems. And so it doesn't just matter to have the right car, you also have to have an effective govern, govern, governance system. And that's one where, you know, if I were to predict, and, and, and this is to say, I, it's not like I don't want to see rapid automation of logistics, I really would like to see it. 
Um, and if I had to predict which uh, where it would happen first, I would point to countries with um, very robust state capacity. So, for example, you know, looking at and, and one proxy for that might be sort of response to COVID or something along those lines. And I, I think that, you know, you're probably going to see the deployment of these things faster in China, um, in uh, Taiwan, perhaps even Australia than you would see in, in many other parts of the world because of that. But, you know, to get back to this sort of idea of rapid automation, I, I hope to see it, but I think we have to recognize how much of it is a socio-technical system in logistics and transport. With respect to mining and agriculture, those are areas where you, uh, once you own the property of the mine or the um, agricultural fields, whatever it might be, um, the person in charge has much more control and can therefore just sort of set the robots off to do their job. And so there, again, we're seeing faster um, uh, automation in mining agriculture um, trend than we are in places like transport and logistics because you have less of this sort of like socio-technical interface. Um, and medical testing as well, you know, we could all hope for better forms of automated medical testing, although there was a rather sinister looking um, COVID testing robot that was um, uh, profiled, I think, in The Verge uh, last fall that I don't think took on because people were a little afraid that, you know, what happens if it malfunctions and presses the the um, uh, testing tube uh, too far into the person's uh, nose or, or, or mouth. Um, but, and that trust issue is something that comes up a lot, but overall, you know, you can see the paradigm cases for rapid automation in all of these fields. Now, I think that, you know, the, I, I contrast that with, uh, or to set forward a little bit more of the background for an intervention like mine and, and some of the other books that I think are coming out in the same direction, a lot of books sort of use that ideal of rapid uh, automation of manufacturing and combine it with the disruption narrative of people like Clayton Christensen, who've been talking for uh, uh, Christensen's work for decades, uh, talked about the potential for technology to disrupt existing fields and to replace existing human practitioners, even if it was worse, simply because it was cheaper. Um, and I think that out of those sort of paradigm cases of the success of automation, out of things like, of course, uh, the success of AlphaGo um, and out of the uh, success of uh, in, in manufacturing, similar fields, um, a number of books predicted that um, white collar jobs or professional jobs would be automated as fast as or even faster than um, many manufacturing or other jobs had been automated in the past. And, you know, these, these run the gamut in terms of their ideological or um, uh, visionary aspects. I mean, Age of Spiritual Machines is a relatively old book, uh, but by a very influential um, engineer, Ray Kurzweil, who now works at, at Google, um, uh, foreseeing a human singularity, where essentially humans and machines merge because machines become so much better at imitating and then improving upon what we have done in the past. Um, I think Rise of the Robots was another very influential book from, I think, about 2014 that was sort of predicting something similar. Um, humans need not apply. Um, you know, I, I would put together the Kurzweil and the Teg Tegmark in terms of their emphasis on the very long term. Um, and then I would also put together um, uh, Humans Need Not Apply and McAfee and Brynjolfsson in terms of a more shorter term um, approach toward this uh, uh, prediction of pretty rapid automation and pretty rapid uh, and coming for uh, professional white collar jobs. Um, but I think always on the other side, there was a, a leitmotif of um, caution and of worry of what would happen if this automation happened too quickly, um, in a sense that it just couldn't happen that quickly. So for example, like if you look at the, the very um, uh, subtle uh, anthropological work of someone like Lucy Suchman and her human mach machine reconfiguration. out by James Besson more recently in Learning by Doing. And, you know, both of those authors thought it was, you know, much more questionable whether, for example, advanced AI software could just replace um, paralegals, let alone lawyers, right? And, and what's remarkable in Besson's work is he looks at the actual um, job figures from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, and finds that, you know, some of these things that people had just predicted would be, these jobs that people predicted would just be wiped away by AI, actually seem to be increasing. Um, uh, Besson particularly looks at bank tellers and at um, uh, um, in law firms at paralegals. Um, you see also some recent uh, more counterintuitive work 
by people like Leslie Wilcox saying essentially that the problem is not going to be a lack of work, uh, jobless futures, but in fact, infinite work because all of the sort of sensing apparatus of uh, ubiquitous computing is going to create so much data that we're going to need so many people to sort through it and try to make sense of it all. Um, and, and I think that also is, and, and so those are, that sort of is a counterintuitive uh, or countering the mainstream discourse about jobless futures due to AI. Um, also, there are there's work like Nicholas Cage's the Gla Nicholas Carr's uh, the Glass Cage, and and Carr I think very sensitively in a, in, in a uh, very qualitative manner looks at the problems uh, posed by uh, rapid automation. Um, uh, flying and says that, you know, by and large, it's very good that we have all these backup automated systems, but sometimes they cause skill degradation. And so we need sort of an ongoing effort to avoid skill degradation by human professionals. And then finally, I think Sophia Noble's um, uh, Algorithms of Repression is particularly, was particularly prescient, a 2018 book, in looking at the problems caused uh, just in, in an area that I characterize in New Laws of Robotics as undergoing the most rapid automation which is in the selection, arrangement, uh, and salience of um, media stories, right? And so one of the things that she has talked about in that, uh, in Algorithms of Repression, are the ways in which very malign forces can learn to outwit or to fool algorithms in order to uh, do things that are um, uh, problematic for a number of people, you know, and she, and the famous examples of, of hers is, of course, uh, Google autofill, but she has other examples that I think are quite compelling. For example, um, you know, the automated gener automated analysis of user generated content um, on recommender sites or things like that. And so part of what I think the, the role of the, the works like cars and nobles and such ones and mine is to rebalance the automation discourse more and to sort of get us focused on um, the, the sort of uh, interaction between the human computer interaction as opposed to narratives of substitution of AI and robotics for individuals. For example, one of my first chapters in the book, and it was recently excerpted in Engadget, um, was a chapter on medicine. And you know, we in, in medicine, there were predictions, I think, by one Silicon Valley venture capitalist a few years ago said 85% of doctors will just be gone. Um, another machine learning expert said that radiologists are like wild E. coyote um, over the cliff, just looking downward. And, you know, that their job is just pattern recognition. Machines will do it better. They're going to fall off the cliff and be gone. Right. And, and one of the things I talk about in the book is that actually, again, the, the more increasing amount of imaging and richer sets of imaging that are uh, created by um, uh, new technical systems in fact, you do need more human expertise. And I was happy to see that on LinkedIn recently, the president of the Norwegian Society of Radiologists uh, was recommending my book um, and saying, yeah, this is, you know, he's, he's sort of bringing together a lot of um, uh, literature on um, the future of radiology as not mere uh, mechanical pattern matching, but something that has um, a higher aspiration and a more human connection to it. Um, and so that's sort of a, a one, one example where even in these fields like radiology, dermatology, um, uh, pathology, uh, there will be change, but the role of the AI and machine learning seems very hard to get beyond, say, advising the professional as opposed to replacing them. So in Simon Head's thoughtful distinction, you know, my second bullet point here, it will be a matter of practice, I believe, and not predetermined process to optimize medical responses to new volumes and varieties of data. And you're going to see this sort of technology complementing professionals. Now, of course, in some other areas, there are areas where um, I think due to cost constraints, you'll see what um, uh, Brian Shepard has characterized as premature disruption, right? There could be a premature disruption of the field, for example, where insurance firms might say to those who are insured, we would, uh, we'll cover the full cost of your chatbot therapy, but we will only cover 50% or less of your talking to a human therapist. And what's going to be fascinating there, I believe, is going to be the battle among those who are advancing the automated systems in terms of their uh, trying to characterize it, uh, outcomes as either being better or worse than the humans. Um, and I think that actually, if the human therapists uh, engage in that, they're almost uh, fated to lose because I don't think they have the resources um, in order to uh, engage in sort of the battle of expertise that would be involved in the meta expertise to evaluate how well the experts are doing. But what I also try to do in the book is to say that um, in some fields, and I would, I would include a lot of therapy and education in those fields, that in fact, 
um, the human interaction is constitutive of the, of the field as opposed to merely being one among many ways in which we could deliver content. And so that's another way in which I argue for an ongoing um, need for human expertise uh, to be complemented by AI and robotics, but not to be uh, replaced by it. Um, part of the vision here is a, a vision coming out of long-standing discussions of AI governance and algorithmic accountability. So if we were to think about, you know, on the right-hand side of the slide, an increasing pressure toward governance by artificial intelligence. For example, I, I would say that the um, uh, credit scoring, particularly as it becomes more complex and brings in more and more variables and more complex um, analysis of the variables, becomes something like governance by artificial intelligence, right? Rather than having individual people, individual jobs, deciding um, uh, on a more qualitative basis, who's worthy of credit and who's not, you have the big algorithm doing it, right? You have some very complex algorithmic system that would be doing it. And, you know, the complexity of these systems is, is fascinating. And uh, I'll talk a little bit later about, a little bit more about financial AI, because I think that's another area, like in finance, as in, as in journalism and media, there's been a, a huge adoption of AI, um, sometimes with good effect, but sometimes with very troubling ones. But this sort of governance by artificial intelligence is critically, is reaching a sort of critical mass in finance. And I think we, we've also seen some battles on it, even in something as mundane as traffic laws, right? I mean, in terms of red light cameras, um, there are uh, a red light photo enforced uh, system can be designed to be entirely automated, right? And we could even go so far as to automate it to the point that it would not merely uh, snap a picture of a car when it goes under a red light, you know, when it travels under the red light when it shouldn't be, but we could also cross-reference the, the license plate back to a database of uh, persons and then back to a bank account, then automatically take the money out of the person's bank account, right, from the fine. Now, I'm not advocating that, but I'm saying that it is part of the future of, say, a purely automated law enforcement system. And when we get to that point, we really are being governed by machines. Um, and that, I think, is, is a situation that um, uh, it could be of some benefit in, a, in just a few very narrowly defined areas. But by and large, people push back against it. And they even push back against red light cameras. So if you look at the literature on red light cameras, I didn't get to get this into the Laws of Robotics book, but um, I have it in another article that I'm going to cite later on in the talk. Um, there's a huge pushback of people saying it's not constitutionally permissible to allow a robot to just give me a ticket, right? They just say that I, I need due process. And if you look at the rollout of the, of the systems, for example, in New York, um, New York was one of the first jurisdictions to have red light uh, camera enforcement. There was the, the machine took pictures, but the pictures were reviewed by persons. Um, so even there, you know, where it seems the simplest possible application of AI, there is still a certain holding back and an insistence upon um, a person being able to look at the, the picture. One reason you might want to look at the picture, for example, is if the car is co-owned by um, a wife and a husband, you know, are you going to be going after which one of them was the actual driver of the car, right? Um, that might be one. If it, so, so just that very elementary thing is something that took uh, some level of human intervention. Because of this type of pushback, I think that's why you're seeing more and more buzz about governance of artificial intelligence. Um, so, for example, at places like the Office of Privacy Commissioner of Canada, in Europe at the Data Protection Authorities, um, in the U.S. at NIST, at places like the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics, which is you know, just an advisory board, but still is thinking about it. All of those are areas where there is a certain demand to govern the artificial intelligence and not simply allow it to be deployed via ordinary market processes. Um, the question then becomes, how do you govern it, right? I mean, how, what are our principles in terms of governing artificial intelligence? And I think that there's two waves here. A first wave is to improve the accuracy, fairness, safety, and efficacy in extant and development technologies. So in, in terms of fairness, you might think about things like um, anti-discrimination rules, right? If it turned out that an AI system was consistently not identified as minority groups, we might be very worried about that AI system and to say that this is something that is systematically disenfranchising or not including uh, members of minority groups. Of course, it's more complex than that, and I'll get to that in the second wave. Um, and actually, because there might be people who don't want that sort of recognition or don't want that type of uh, ability for the system to know the face and uh, match the face of everyone to a name. But we do have that sort of like dialogue with respect to improving accuracy, fairness, safety, and efficacy. That's a lot, I think, of the current discourse on 
fairness and accountability and transparency in machine learning, the FACCT conference, um, which you know, used to be called the FATML conference, those sorts of conferences are, are definitely looking at those first wave concerns. The second wave of concern is questioning certain trends in methods of ranking, rating, and evaluating persons. So whereas the first wave, let's talking about you know, anti-discrimination with facial recognition, first wave um, folks might say, I want to have facial recognition systems that recognize women as well as men, um, ethnic minorities as well as the dominant ethnic group. Um, we want to make sure that they all are have an error rate that is equal. And I think in the second wave, there are individuals that say, let's not have facial recognition. Right? Um, there are people calling for moratoria on facial recognition. Um, similarly, with respect to the first wave and the second wave, you see that with respect to some of this research that's now being done. I call it, you know, physiognomy research. People that are using vast databases, say on Tinder, to predict a person's uh, sexual orientation by their face or via um, other databases of faces to predict their political party affiliation by their face. Okay. Now, the first wave would say, well, let's make sure that, you know, this type of, uh, uh, this is, has a, uh, is more and more accurate over time and that it uses um, uh, highly qualified data or data that has actually been uh, vetted as it's making these types of predictions. The second wave would say it's just inherently unethical to create an AI that is trying to classify people on the basis of their face. That we've done, um, uh, uh, we've done the experiment. We know that if, you know if we look back on the long history of things like physiognomy um, and phrenology and uh, Cesar Lombroso's sort of efforts to classify criminals on the basis of you know you could be a, seen as a criminal on the basis of having a certain type of face, um, that this is a bad thing, right? And there was a number of researchers. I think over two thousand researchers signed a letter last year. Um, asking a publisher to preemptively not publish a draft paper that was claiming to be able to have um, some uh, uh, further ability to um, uh, predict criminality or potential criminal activity on the basis of um, either still images or video images of people's faces um, before the um, uh, predicted criminality, right? So uh, thinking about these two ways of algorithmic accountability, I think it's it's very useful both to uh, have the complementary complementarity ideal that I developed earlier in the talk, but also to have the substantive principles of governance, which are both thinking about fairness and anti-discrimination, but are also drawing some red lines on the type of AI that we want to have, right? And of course, red lines come up most commonly when you talk about military applications, for example, with respect to um, killer robots, um, but they also are something that's like an ongoing controversy within the AI ethics field. To what extent do you want to have red lines or not? And the European High Level Expert Group on Artificial Intelligence recently had a big controversy over um, whether its reports on ethics and AI should say, here are the red lines, don't cross them, or should merely be descriptive and characterizations, normative characterizations of different forms of AI technology. Now, thinking further about these two waves, if you wanted to make them more concrete, within medical AI and robotics. And again, the, the book only has one chapter on medical AI and robotics, but it's a useful, you know, it's something we've all had experience of. So it's useful to sort of think, think it through, I think through this frame. Um, the first wave is about, for example, in machine learning and dermatology, making sure that um, uh, uh, dermatological tools that try to identify, for example, melanoma or other skin anomalies, that they work as well with darker skinned as lighter skinned patients. Um, that's been already in the medical literature um, and, and I cite some of it in the book. Um, with respect to learning healthcare systems, these are systems that try to, you know, based on the original characterization of learning healthcare systems in the Institute of Medicine report in 2007, they try to learn from past treatments to develop better treatments uh, in the future, to see from within natural variation of treatment within a given hospital or hospital system, or maybe even, you know, regional systems to the extent that we have actual electronic health record interoperability, they can try to learn there. And again, the issue becomes, is this sort of data, is it really effective? Is it well-coded enough, et cetera? And one of the things I just find interesting, again, bringing in that complementarity ideal before, is are we um, expecting too much unpaid labor by doctors to do all sorts of new forms of um, data uh, um, uh, transcription and entry and observation? Do we need more people like scribes to come in and to perform that role if we really want AI to work well? And then with respect to robotic surgery, again, a lot of concerns about um, efficacy, uh, better technology, 
Um, an interesting concern that arises in robotic technology is uh, you know, uh, how well is it being devised for all different body types, um, for those with, say, for example, very high BMIs versus lower BMIs, et cetera. Um, those are all first wave concerns. Once we get to the second wave, though, of algorithmic accountability, we can question certain trends altogether. So, for example, with comprehensive surveillance tools in hospitals, there was some enthusiasm a few years ago for uh, you know, having certain forms of badging or other forms of uh, monitoring of uh, hospital personnel to ensure that they are always um, maintaining safety protocols. Um, and certainly there are vulnerable communities that need that type of protection. But there also is an ongoing conversation among medical workers about you know, whether they should always be on stage, always being watched. And I think that that is going to be a very delicate negotiation over time is you know to what extent you know if you have for example um, robotics or um, iot systems within a hospital that could sense what's going on or sense whether any particular uh, member of the staff had washed their hands upon, immediately upon entering any sort of patient room um, is that something to deploy and how does it get deployed and what are the limits on it similarly with respect to robotic therapy or automated therapy and chatbot therapists um, is that something to aspire to or not um, and would we ever be able to articulate a range of outcomes that would allow us to say with certainty that say the automated therapist had done better than the um, human therapist? Or is there something about that sort of human to human interaction that is uh, necessary um, uh, the, to that sort of process? And similarly with robotic caregiving, if you look at some of the polls in Europe, um, there are polls that state that 60% of Europeans would never want to see a robotic caregiver, right? And um, that what I discussed in the book in further detail is how certain forms of robotic um, care work when they complement human caregivers, or they at least work better, um, as opposed to uh, uh, being seen as a potential substitute for human caregivers, right? Um, that, so that's sort of the, that second wave coming back again. Um, we see that it, there are other sort of, uh, I think, case studies that I think are fascinating. For example, within education, um, the, the dragon bot on the left is merely a cell phone sort of inserted into a uh, stuffed animal's body. And so in that case, you know, the, the child is sort of learning that the cell phone can sort of play a game and can sort of ask the child to um, uh, do, uh, to teach it a song or something along those lines or teach or to the, the, the uh, stuffed animal might be sort of made into a robot for those purposes. And it's sort of seen as something of a toy, right? It's seen as a toy that would be used, um, that can be used or put away or, or kept a, at will. Um, I think with respect to um, uh, humanoid robots being deployed as teachers, say in elementary school classrooms or in small groups, again, more as, a, as we move closer to the idea of the teacher being replaced by the robot, I think more ethical concerns arise. And there's already been experimentation in this manner um, within, in Japan. Um, with respect to a robot called the Saya. And so there's some, there's a really interesting uh, uh, dichotomy and tension, I think, going on now in those areas with respect to um, uh, uh, do we envision the, the, the robotics in education as toys to supplement, or are there ever situations where you'd want to have, say, a substitution of, of the teacher? To boil down some of my new laws of robotics, you know, in the book, um, I've talked a lot about um, complementarity uh, uh, and not counterfeiting humanity. Um, but my bottom line here is that essentially, with respect to complementarity, we want intelligence augmentation to be prefer preferred over artificial intelligence, particularly in professions. And I try to devise the professional line as something that is sort of a rough and ready, of course not perfect, but a rough and ready line between the areas where we would have um, an openness to rapid substitutive automation of machines for persons, as opposed to in professions where we would have so more of a uh, looking for the robotics and AI to complement the individual. And part of the reason I do that is because I feel like in professions, um, there is much more of an opportunity to have, among the professionals, to have ongoing conversation, education, um, debate, discussion about the very nature of the field, about what's good and what's bad, and about what technology works well for clients and what doesn't. Right, as opposed to in non-professional roles, often there's less of that sort of an opportunity. Maybe there should be more. And one of the things I entertain in the book is that perhaps we should have many more professions than we do now. But I try to draw the line and say, at the very least, the professions we have now, by and large, you want to have complementarity as opposed to substitution. Counterfeiting humanity also is part of that. I mean, I think that is part of the, the sort of concern about uh, 
premature automation in places like caregiving uh, therapy, other roles like that. Um, with cooperation, that's mainly something I talk about in the law enforcement and um, uh, military context. And similarly, with respect to responsibility, that's something where I think always we need to have an ability to understand where our robots are coming from and where they are um, and, and who owns them and who does not. Um, just very quickly, you know, in terms of some theoretical foundations here, I mean, I think in terms of the, the one of the things, you know, in terms of writing a book like New Laws of Robotics, I try to write the book so it's as accessible as possible. So that, you know, in people who have never really um, thought about uh, or dealt with literature on AI and robotics before are able to pick up the book and just sort of be led right into uh, these sort of topics. Um, but I also have tried to, in um, other more theoretical work, try to ensure that there is like a theoretical foundation for some of the positions that I take. And so, for example, with respect to complementarity, I did a deep dive into the literature on professional judgment and AI um, in, a, in a journal called Boundary 2 um, in 2019. And, and what the idea behind that article is that, you know, there's this really rich literature by people like Hubert Dreyfus um, and uh, Charles Taylor and other philosophers who are thinking about the sort of scope of artificial intelligence, even in the 1960s. And um, what, what's fascinating about that literature is that it really helps us see that even when the AI project was at its very inception, there were those that were worried that it was very, it was easy for machines and robotics to affect to mimic um, and to sort of uh, uh, disguise themselves as possessing a level of um, expertise that they really didn't have. But people had a certain automation bias in dealing with them. And I think dealing with that, I think is, is part of the, what I'm doing practically in the New Laws of Robotics book. Um, moreover, with respect to counterfeiting humanity, um, that uh, very recently, I, I just uh, had, a, had a way of distilling all of the insights of the book about affective computing into uh, an article for a publication called Real Life. Um, and, and there, I really sort of uh, question the move toward developing computers that are alleged to be able to understand us and to know what we're feeling, and also to affect feelings themselves. I think that that is inevitably um, a counterfeiting or a form of mimicry that is um, uh, deceptive because the robotics cannot have the sort of forms of empathy that human beings have. And I think that our development of robots goes in a very different direction if we think of them always as uh, being machines incapable of affect and not uh, develop, not, not possibly developing affect, then if we try to go into the direction where I think affective computing is going, which is to sort of develop computing machinery that uh, is, wants to be treated as uh, a human would. With respect to arms races, um, uh, my work on legal automation um, focuses on that. A lot of people have, have talked about legal technology as a way to level the playing field and as a way to bring more people, include more people uh, as getting legal representation. What I do in my work is I try to play out how that will look in two, three, four iterations down the road. And what I conclude is that, you know, for every good hearted legal technologist who develops an app to help a tenant avoid um, eviction, right? There are now apps that do that. You can download an app that says, hey, you're about to be evicted. Here's some advice for you. There's probably five to 10 times as much money going into an app that will help landlords evict people more rapidly, right? And that's where I, I use some of the logic out of even people like the, the those behind the Ban Killer Robots campaign and others that do more military work. I apply that sort of logic of arms races in an array of fields in law enforcement, in um, attacks, in uh, all sorts of areas where people can use computing and robotics to get ahead of each other. Um, and that's where I really, I, I admire the work of, of Noblis and before it might or in others in terms of trying to play out in scenario analysis where things are going, not just next year, but 5, 10, 15 uh, years down the road. Because I think so much work in this field is uh, in, including, and I think even especially the public interest work, is thinking about the next problem or just how to solve the immediate problem but not thinking about the larger social dynamics that are unleashed by AI and robotics. And finally, with respect to attribution, um, this uh, Ohio State article was something that I, I wrote up as a response to the work of, of, of Jack Balkan on, on law and the algorithmic society. But the bottom line of sort of attribution there is essentially, and that is my fourth law of robotics in the book, is on the one hand, it's very pedestrian, right? We all have, uh, anyone who drives knows that before you drive, you've got to have a license plate for your car. 
so that the license plate indicates ultimately who owns the car. It's not obvious. It's not like your name is on it, but at least if you do something really bad, we can find out you know, who owns the car. And in a very pedestrian way, I approve of efforts by the FAA, other regulators, to try to ensure that drones have some identifier on them so that we can trace back you know, who did what with respect to a drone. But I think that like there's something deeper about this law, right? Which is that there's this huge literature and people talking now about um, uh, out of control robots, robots that just could could do things, and, and how we could solve what's called the alignment problem, right? How do we, if we have autonomous machines, how do we ensure that their programming um, aligns with our own? I personally think that's impossible. I think that even if you were to have the machine uh, being developed with the best of uh, alignment within it. Um, to use the, the language I think Stuart Russell and others have used, that it could always be hacked. And so therefore, I think that there's you've got to go a further step and have sort of incentives for people to avoid uh, creating uh, entities that could be hacked and could have um, uh, disastrous counter uh, effects from that. And therefore, um, attributing any AI robotics to a person or corporation helps ensure that. And I think it's so important because we know how to punish and deter people and corporations of course, we don't know perfectly how to do that, but of course, we we have some uh, some history, some track record going back decades in the case of corporations and centuries in the case of people. We don't have that with respect to robotics and AI, and that's why I think that attribution is so important, essentially, to nip in the bud the very possibility of autonomous machines and robotics. And so, with that, you know, this is my my uh, intervention in this debate. Um, I, I realize it's for 40 minutes in. I have lots more to say, but I want to be sure that we uh, have an opportunity for questions. So um, I want to open up for questions now, and then um, if we don't have any, I can come back to some other uh, points from the book. But with that, um, uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate uh, the chance to speak with everyone today. Thank you, Frank, and for introducing your new laws to us. Um, this is an area where Noblis has invested a lot of um, research, uh, internal R&D funding, and, and helping our government customers navigate many of the challenges that you um, you uh, mentioned in your book and really around governance and you know trust and how do we um, assure uh, AI algorithms and how do we secure them and how do we um, think about things differently from an augmentation perspective as opposed to just replacement of, of humans and uh, you know lots of, of, of work and, and folks on this call that have been uh, focused there. Um, and so I'm going to start with just a fundamental question. Um, you know, I know you started with some very interesting use cases in your talk, um, and then I'll get to the chat window because I know some folks have some very focused questions. Um, but what was the inspiration behind this particular book in addition to your other works that you've uh, created? Um, what was really the inspiration behind this one? What a great question. You know, I mean, I think that the the real inspiration for me for this book, and I, I almost, I would have really enjoyed uh, starting off with this, was the dialogue that was coming out in the early 2010s, where the idea was that if a machine can watch everything you do and can store it, and then can potentially map all possible situations you'll be in, that you'll be replaced by the machine. And I found that so interesting because what I would find myself doing is I would give examples and I'd say, like, for example, in some of my legal work, I would look at robotic chatbots um, or uh, uh, even a company like LegalZoom. And I would say, look, they, they say that they can draft a will for anybody, but it turns out that when they tried to do a certain form of disposition of assets, they missed the certain type of asset, and that will not be covered by this will. You need to do additional paperwork. So people are getting, um, I thought, a false sense of comfort out of certain documents, right, that were being prepared automatically or near automatically. And then what I would hear back from people is they'd say, thank you. In version 2.0, we'll use your critique and we'll make it better, right? So if, if you have a situation where anything that's done automatically or via as a robotically or AI, if you ever critique it, the people who make it say, oh, yes, thanks for the critique. We're going to incorporate it back in. Then it seems as though we're on a sort of um, a glide path to complete automation. Right, because any critique you have of the automation will itself be turned against you, you to make the automation better. So part of what I started thinking about as the inspiration for the book was thinking, how do you break that cycle, right? How do you break that cycle and say that? And I think part of how you break the cycle is you say, you know, I may have a certain problem with this that I can demonstrate as objectively correct, but there's gonna be lots of other people that have problems with it and we may all disagree as to what the problem is. 
And when we all disagree as to what the problem is, then it's very hard to automate because then you need governance to figure out who's going to be the one to actually decide how to change the system, how to change the program. And so that's one way. And I think the book sort of goes into various other ways in which you can either um, stop the automation entirely or try to point out the, the ways in which humans are going to be necessary to mediate between critics of automation and, and its uh, correction. But it's a great question. And I think that that was sort of, um, uh, it was in my own field in law where there was a huge debate among law school professors over whether the decline in people going to law school was cyclical or structural. Like in 2008 to 2010 to 2012, a lot of people were saying, look, it's structural. We're just getting rid of lawyers. Um, but then some people that I, I trusted more said, no, it's actually just cyclical. It'll bounce back. And it has largely. And, and so I think that's a really interesting question. Now, of course, I'm not saying that I think that, you know, um, that it should be that way. Um, in terms of, you know, there being a certain number of, of a given uh, number of professionals in society. But I think that overall, though, um, there are so many examples that I've seen in my research where um, uh, the premature automation is much more of a danger than um, rapid substitution of, of AI and robotics for the persons in those fields. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. It's um, it's very interesting, you know, as we uh, you know, try to learn and and see some of the unintended consequences and the feedback and validation of, of various uh, systems and how they are, like you said, used to to perform or take them into a, to a completely different direction. And we've certainly lived through that here at Nobles with um, some of our algorithms that we've developed for one use case that, in, in fact, ended up solving problems that we you know didn't even dream of uh, because we weren't weren't focusing in that that arena. Um, I'll move to the chat window now. Um, I'll start with, I'll just go with the first one posted here. Um, one of our employees is interested in, in learning whether or not you have any information on China's social credit system and the use of AI. Oh, yeah. yes, yes. Um, that's a great question. And I think um, in chapter five, uh, that's called machines judging humans. I have at the end of that chapter, um, my perspective on the Chinese SCS. And it's a fascinating area because when I started researching it, um, I was very uh, suspicious of it. And I thought that this seemed like a very troubling uh, form of what I call unitary scoring. Um, I think it uh, makes sense to have, say, a credit score for an individual and potentially to have an employment score and to have all these different scores. You, you could have some, uh, they could play some role in terms of assessing a person's productivity, likelihood to repay, um, aptitude as a student, all these sorts of things, right? But when you had um, an overarching score that could be used in all these different contexts, that's what worried me. What I found was that in the uh, literature on the social credit scoring system, there's been, there's a lot of confusion and um, uh, there's a lot of um, conflict over it. And, as a, and, and so what I ultimately found was that, um, the, the way in which this SCS is being used um, right now is very localized and that it seems to have relatively narrow applications. So I'm still, I worry a lot about it expanding. And what I try to do in the book is to say that we should set certain red lines that would not allow the social credit score to go in certain directions. So one of the red lines that I set is I say that it's not legitimate, for example, to have one person's score affect the uh, uh, score of their associates, right, or their family. So I say that like, it would be very troubling, for example, if a social credit score for the father uh, of a family was then used to discredit um, the children, right? And there was one example that I have in one of the footnotes of the book of uh, a, a student being denied admission to college because their father, uh, his father had not paid the debt, had not paid a debt. Right. And um, the worry I have is that, of course, that could be used in political ways as well. That if someone's a dissenter, then all of the people around them could have their credit scores drop and they could be notified of that. And I think that that sort of like and I, uh, that sort of networked um, collateral consequences are very troubling. But I also think simultaneously, um, we in the U.S. need to be very cautious about sort of um, automatically ruling, feeling in any way um, superior or, or saying well, our, our system is, is better because that, that term, collateral consequences, I draw it from a literature and law about the extensive collateral consequences that those who have uh, felony or misdemeanor convictions or even sometimes arrests experience. Right? There are whole uh, articles like by Michael Pinard about all these ways in which if one has, say, one... Uh, my apologies for this. 
um, if one has one um, uh, uh, conviction, that could lead to not getting public housing, not getting a job, not having certain opportunities for student loans, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, part of what I tried to do in the book is I said that, you know, we need to uh, center this uh, ethical discussion on the social credit scoring system, um, not as a first in terms of looking at its, its fairness and um, at the accuracy and objectivity of the, of the sort of uh, uh, material fed into it, but also with an eye to how it can encode and reinforce very unfair methods of evaluating ranking and rating individuals um, that are more prevalent than in the social credit scoring system itself. Um, so that sort of is where I went with it. I, I have a few other um, insights there, but what I try to do in that chapter is like, it's called machines judging humans. And I talk about all these ways in which machines are sort of creating scores and evaluations of individuals, for example, hiring algorithms, um, uh, threat prediction algorithms, other things like that. And by the end, I try to develop a more theoretical perspective saying, here are some red lines of what these systems should never do. Um, and here are some ways in which they might be uh, helpful. So thanks. Thanks, Frank. That was, that was a great answer. Thanks. And there's a related question. So I'm going to jump to the related question because it's around objectivity and avoiding bias in machines. And uh, the question is, you know, if a requirement for AI is that humans are involved in the process, why can we assume that humans are good mediators for objectivity when they've shown a history of bias and are notoriously slow to improve? Right. So, I mean, I think that the part of the complementarity is about trying to ensure that there is an ongoing dialogue among those in different professional fields. So, for example, I mean, and I'll, I'll give a, another example from law, which I think is really an you know, probably a well-known one, which is there was a study that stated that um, uh, I think it was judges in Israel were giving lighter sentences to people after lunch than before lunch. Okay. Now, there is work by Harvard Law Professor Holger Spalman on SSRN, like disputing the study, saying he felt it was implausible. So, so but I'll set that aside. Let's let's assume it is plausible that you have that that the judges were giving um, uh, uh, harder sentences after lunch than before. Um, clearly, that's an example where you might say, well, machines aren't hungry. So, if the machines were doing the sentences, it would be fairer, right? Um, and that's the way it was received by many. I remember just hearing uh, podcasts, others, people sort of saying hey, this is an area where we should really try to make sure that um, we, we should try to accelerate um, automated forms of sentencing in order to avoid these types of uh, prejudicial effects or biased effects. But my sense is that, you know, uh, ultimately, there's a com more complex discussion to be had. One part of the discussion could be, let's make sure judges have snacks available at all times. Right, so like they never feel that hungry, and they're never in a situation where they're hangry or whatever the term might be, you know, hungry and angry. Um, uh, also, though, um, in some discussions I've had with European, uh, one European jurist, and then uh, people in a research group in this European group, we've been thinking a lot about the French effort to ban predictive analytics on judging. Right, so France goes in the direction of saying we ban this. We think that it's very bad to have these sort of statistical reports on judges. And, and thinking, why would they do that? Well, one reason they might do it is, imagine that you are, there's a judge, and the judge has been notified, for example, that they have, let's say, social security disability determinations. The judge has been notified that they have been granting 60% of the disability de determinations, whereas, in general, in their, in their cohort nationwide, only 40% are granted, okay? Um, would you want to be the next person to go in front of that judge? Well, I guess maybe you would because you think they're the easy judge. On the other hand, if you're the person going in front of that judge who has just been notified that, boy, you better get your numbers under control, um, that could lead to some bias there as well. And so there's a really fascinating sort of interplay there. And, and it comes out in, there's a, there's a classic New York uh, U.S. court case called Nash v. Bowen, where this, these sorts of issues were taken to the Supreme Court. Um, but it's really interesting to sort of think about, you know, how um, you end up with um, uh, proper debiasing in scenarios like that. So my bottom line would be that I think that, you know, the, the uh, I don't accept the idea that uh, machines and AI can do it just better than human beings, because then I think all we're doing is we're shifting the locus of bias from the person who is the judge the in, in the sort of legal role 
to whoever might be um, uh, counted on to replace them. And certainly in Daniel Keith Citrin's work, Technological Due Process, you see a lot of examples where there were um, either, uh, uh, there were unintended biases um, built into, structurally built into um, uh, systems used to automate um, benefit uh, receipt and benefit uh, determinations. Um, but I do think that with a very reflective approach, one can bring in the AI tools to inform professionals about their potential to make mistakes and that ultimately risk reduction and reduction in mistakes is where I see the great promise of these tools, both in, in, in all of the professions that I've discussed, um, ranging from medicine to education to law to journalism and, and, and others. So, yeah. All right, thank you. I think we have maybe room for one more. Um, we'll see where, where we go. Let me jump back up to the top from Braxton. Um, given the strong performance against Turing test, does the limit on counterfeiting humanity present an unenforceable ethic standard? Sure. So I think that that's an area where I strongly support legislation that is uh, bot disclosure online. So um, I believe that's come out of California, where if someone has an, a Twitter account and they just have set up the account, but it's emitting um, a programmed language, say from even from a very sophisticated model like GPT-3, I think that it has to be labeled as such and that we should not allow our online sphere to degenerate into a world where um, there can just be uh, uh, robots uh, and bots imitating human beings. So I'm not necessarily so concerned with the deception. I think you're absolutely right with the, I, I mean, with the, with the um, difficulty of deceiving other people, because I think you're right to say, the questioner is right to say that these systems are going to only get more and more uh, sophisticated in their ability to uh, mimic human beings. Um, just as counterfeiters have got more and more sophisticated in terms of their ability to uh, mimic what uh, paper or plastic money looks like. But I think that this is where the law has to step in and to require the disclosure that these are bot accounts. Um, because, and I, I, st I pioneered that sort of argument with respect to people using AI to find favorable judges. Um, I proposed in 2018 that always anyone who uses that AI to uh, shop for a given forum as a matter of the ethics of lawyering has to disclose that they used it. And I think similarly with respect to say bots online or other areas where there could be that sort of that sort of uh, uh, situation that it be disclosed. I'd also say, by the way, it, it should work the other way as well. Um, for example, there's something called the Care Coach that is a um, uh, uh, AI-like avatar that is used uh, in a Medicare program in uh, Massachusetts, where it's an animated cat, but it's voiced by uh, workers, I believe, in um, uh, India and the Philippines. Uh, and then the workers say things, and then uh, voice recognition software translate it into a mechanical voice, not their own voice, but a mechanical voice that is mouthed by the cat. I think that sort of situation of photomation or faux automation, that that should be disclosed as well. Um, but part of it really is in this not, not counterfeiting humanity is not um, uh, pretending to be uh, anything more than the, than the bot or AI itself actually is. Great, thank you. And I see our chief technology officer, Chris Barnett. Um, did you have any final words for Frank? Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and for uh, the rich discussion. Uh, we really appreciate having you back here uh, on a topic that is so near and dear to our noblest hearts. Um, Chris, would you like to close with anything? Yeah, you can't hide. And thank you, Millie, for hosting. And and Frank, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, you know, terrifically you know, insightful. I, I'm I'm particularly interested in maybe following up with you on some of the global standards for AI governance. You know, that, that's an area that we're, that we're tracking closely across industry because it has direct influence on our on our government clients, certainly. But uh, very informative and thank you for thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Millie. I really appreciate your uh, your uh, moderating, and it's uh, always great to be here. So, thanks. Yeah.